Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. If you haven't already done so, please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show. And as people have heard me say before, I do this as a public service. I pay for it out of pocket. Please help me. Please join me. Please partner with me to keep it on the air. Patreon.com slash indoctrination. Very, very, very much appreciated. And now for this week's episode. So this week's episode is going to be another crossover episode, meaning that this is an interview I did on a different show. And we are taking the portion of my interview on that show and releasing it as an episode on this show. So this week, you get to hear my conversation with Paula Poundstone and Adam Felber, who some of you may have heard of from Paula's comedy background and from both of their involvement on the radio show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, among other things. I've been a fan of Paula's for many years. And I've also listened to the show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, many times. I always learn new things. And I wanted to let you know that I was so excited when I got invited to be on Paula's podcast called Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, which I think is an awesome name of a podcast, truly. The day that I was invited to be on it, I got two emails back to back. One from one of the producers of Paula's podcast and another from CNN asking if I would be available that night for an on-camera interview, which actually never took place because a news story that broke that day took precedence and absolutely should have. But you know you're a fan of someone's. When you get an invitation to be on their podcast, On the same day, you get an invitation to be on CNN and you hear yourself say, no way, I get to talk to Paula Boundstone? Here's my conversation with Paula and Adam now. Rachel Bernstein is a marriage and family therapist with a specialty in those leaving cults and high control groups. She has worked with victims of cults and emotional abusers for 27 years and believes that given the right set of circumstances, anyone can fall prey to sociopaths and manipulators. She is the host of Indoctrination, a weekly podcast covering cults, manipulators, and protecting yourself from systems of control. Please welcome Rachel Bernstein. Yes. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I was truly looking forward to it. Oh, great. Well, we're so glad you're here. So let's, let's, let's tee up a, a good question right off the bat, which is what is a cult? It's a great question, because if you look up the word cult in the dictionary, it's not really going to define it the way I define it after doing this work and from what we've seen now in the news and stories that we hear. So what it is, is an organization where you have to give unquestioning devotion to the teachings and to the leader. No critical thinking is allowed. No individual thought. Only group think, group speak. It also needs to become your entire life. So you can't join a cult and be into other things. It is the thing that becomes your life and then becomes more important than anything in your life and anyone in your life. It also gives you a whole new identity and it's defined by the group or the leader, what your new identity is, sometimes giving you a new name, a new family. And also it defines your inherent value. So your value is based on how useful you are to the group and how self, self-sacrificial you're going to be to the leader. What makes it also really wow. dangerous is, beyond all of this, is that there's no ethical core. There's no legal core. So what is right and what is wrong, what is legal and what is not, is defined by the leader, not by the state or the country that you're in any longer. You're also never allowed to say no, have any boundaries, have no privacy, and they're they're never done with you. So you might graduate, but you graduate to the next level. The only way you are able to get out of a cult is when you decide you need to leave or 
you have someone help you escape. Wow. Wow. I got to tell you, when I looked up cult in the dictionary, it said, ask Rachel. <laughs> and now so, we know why. Yeah. Now yeah. we know why. Wow. That's, so so if, if any of those attributes that you just listed are lacking, it's not a cult? Well, that's a good question, too, because what we're dealing with is sort of kind of most of the characteristics you're going to see in most cults. You're going to see um, this level of deception that actually is a thread that you see in all cults. You never know what their true intention is for you when you get involved. They will lie to you in their recruitment of you. They'll lie to you while you're there. So you really actually don't know anything about the group. You really, people in cults know the least amount about the group they're in because they're not allowed to access information that we can access about their group. So you're going to see a lot of these characteristics and a lot of the ones really have, again, this thread of deception running through all of them and control and relinquishing of control. Are, are cults legal? Yeah, they are, which is, it blows my mind. I mean, one of the reasons that they're legal is that there aren't enough laws to kind of help people mm, be protected from things that are invisible. I mean, I don't know how you really can prove that you were under undue influence. It's a very hard thing to prove. And the abuse is something that's also quite invisible. And so you also have within cults that well, a lot of the people that I've treated don't know that they were abused because it was called something else in their cult. Mm -hmm. So they never went to the police to say they were being abused or neglected. They thought that was love in their group, or they thought that was what they deserved. And so uh, the amount of abuse and neglect gets really underreported in cults. So a lot of cults are not held up to any kind of microscope or really any kind of mirror, but there are more laws protecting cult leaders than their victims. A lot of cults oh, wow. will say, you know, like, they can cry religious persecution if you go after them, if they're seen as a religion or have tax exempt status. And that's, that's happened uh, many times over and over again. Well, that brings up a good point, which is why is a religion different from a cult or is it? Right. So what I think is important. When you look at cults, now they've become very strategic and also in finding ways to keep their secrets. Usually when you get involved in a religion, they're not going to have you sign waivers right away and sign non-disclosure agreements um, like a cult will. There are many people who have been truly hurt, have wound up in hospitals or in psych units because of their experiences within groups have wound up being quite suicidal and then they will sue their cult and lose because they've signed all that paperwork. And so when you think about a religion, yes, there are some fundamentalist branches of religion that do look pretty culty and mm -hmm. they act pretty culty. They, they do. One of the things that seems to be this difference is, well, two things. One is, again, if I were, let's say, to become... Orthodox, Orthodox Jew, I would know right. what's expected of me, right? I would, I would know what I'm allowed to eat or not and what, where or not. Within a cult, you're never told the information ahead of time, and that's on purpose. So the leader can always berate you for getting it wrong and keep you dependent on them for guidance and make you feel that you can't trust yourself. That's the gaslighting part of it. And so within a religion, you're told up front, listen, this is what we expect of you, you know, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And I think also with a religion, usually, not always, but usually there's a governing body, an outside source that you can go to to complain and an ethics board, somebody. And religions are supposed to follow by laws. And within a cult, they're renegades. There's no one watching the cult leader can get away with anything and they do. And that's how they do. No one is watching what, what they're doing and there's no one to report to. Now in your um, introduction, uh, mm -hmm. Adam said that, that you felt that under the correct set of circumstances, anyone um, could fall prey to a cult. Um, but I was wondering, are there 
common recruits? I mean, are there is there a type of person that they look for? Right. I just want to point out that the kitty poo club is much more like a religion. You can take it or leave it. Uh, I just want to say that right here. That's one of our sponsors, so I'm yes. glad that you think they're not a cult. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I've enjoyed my association with the kitty poo club, and I never signed anything. And uh, you can you can take it or leave it. Wow, it's weird because I did sign something, and I have pledged um, I pledged no. eternal allegiance to Kitty Poo Club's leader, Glenn. Glenn. Um, no, I and think I wait if for you my look, orders from him every week. If you look carefully at the form, it's spelled differently. It's not the same. All right, so oh. sorry to interrupt, uh, which I have a tendency to do. All right, so is there a kind of person that they you know that they they look for? Right. So I think uh, there are a couple of ways to answer that. One is that when I think about cults, most cults are run by um, people with narcissistic personality disorders, not all, but most. And so it's just like what a narcissist is going to look for. They're going to look for people who they think are going to be good recruits. Um, in fact, before answering that question in particular, there is a little story that I wanted to tell you about a client of mine who's a narcissist who's trying to work on it. And he actually said to me, I test people right away. I test to see what I can get away with. I will purposely bump into someone and if they apologize to me, I know I can control them. And wow. So is, is he, has he changed at all since he's now he's not president? Um, a, li a little. <laughs> a little. <laughs> uh, it's a hard sell, though, to do therapy with a narcissist. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. But I thought that's fascinating because cult recruiters are very similar. They're going to look to see who's open, the one who apologizes for things that you did, that you said, the one who's willing to be introspective. And so it's really people's better qualities. And sometimes just being very open, maybe if I were to be at all critical, and I don't mean to blame the victim, but maybe a little too open at times without really knowing what to watch out for and, and the red flags. But you also, and this is why it can happen to anyone, you also have people who are much more vulnerable at different times in their lives. And yeah. right. So they might right. be away from home for the first time, or they just got a diagnosis that was scary. And this group offers them a chance for health uh, or um, being able to live forever or whatever is speaking to them in that mm -hmm. moment. And so, you know, that's why everyone can be vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that Mr. Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore show was a narcissist. But he did confess one time in one episode that he hired Mary, not for her education background, but because she bumped into a desk and she said, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. To the desk. <laughs> yeah. a wow. Surprisingly Fascinating. relevant reference there. That now, is now, when you say everybody could be vulnerable for a cult, how about the kind of people who are potential cult leaders, the narcissists? Are they vulnerable to become cult members? Uh, right. So some of them actually have learned from each other. Some of the people who have gone on to lead their own cults were members of followers oh. of others. And oh. they thought, oh, I can do this better. I've learned how to control people. I now know this theology or technology or whatever it's called. I know it's Scientology. It's called their tech, their technology. And I'm going to start my own group. And so they are still within the programming. They're still kind of under the spell, but they've started their own group. But typically, these are people who really usually answer to no one. And they find a way to cushion themselves and have this sort of protective zone around them where they can get away with anything and say anything and change their mind and abuse people and go off and fly off the handle. And no one will bat an eye. And part of the reason that they set that up is because narcissists do whatever they can to defend against the sort of narcissistic injury, which can be anyone just even saying no or maybe to them instead of an emphatic yes. And so most cult leaders cannot be controlled, but I still do watch out for the ones who have risen to the top of particular groups and kind of in the number two spot. Uh -huh. And so I'm trying to keep track of all these sort of tentacles that reach out in different directions from that one source, from that cult. I'm no expert, but from the little bit that I know, some cult leaders um, can be impeached, but not uh, removed. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, that, that's definitely a thing. That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. I've heard. It's just something I picked up along the way. <laughs> um, uh, so, what are uh, common recruiting techniques? Right. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that they talk about is this idea of love bombing. And it's where people feel very much attended to and someone really looks into their eyes and wants to incorporate them into some kind of mm, connected feeling of community. And we are involved in something that's important and you feel elevated. And, And then also there's the hard sell because cult recruiters are really expert business people. They're very good at the hard sell that you need to make a commitment now before you've mm-hmm. had a chance to think about it, don't go home and think about it. Don't talk to people. Don't read the forms we want you to sign. And they want you, again, to get involved right away. Mm-hmm. And, and so then you really don't have time to think. And they'll usually surround you with other people. It's like people selling a who, car. Like selling a car. Like selling a car. But they, they then. Really, they, they want you to not leave that showroom mm-hmm. right now. And if you act right now, I can get you this deal. I probably can't get you this deal tomorrow. That's why I have six cars. <laughs> so, right, and I, I think the other part, I mean, that maybe this also happens. Oh, seven, with cars. sorry, I just bought one. Seven, one. seven. Yeah, just, okay. just another one. Okay, so maybe it, this might be similar or different from cars, but what they will also do in terms of their recruitment is make you feel like the answers only exist here. You will be making the biggest mistake of your life if you give up this opportunity because there's this idea of influence that's called scarcity. So Mm -hmm. we have the answers. We are the only way. And it's been proven and they'll give all these false senses of, you know, false correlations to... The country is in a terrible place. It has so many problems and only I can fix it. Exactly Hmm. right. I wonder where I heard that before. Right? Exactly. Probably at a car dealership. At a car dealership. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But I think the other thing that makes it interesting about about recruitment is that they will promise you things that are unmeasurable, immeasurable, undefinable. Um, Like they will give you the sense that you can um, have self-actualization or salvation or enlightenment or spiritual healing, empowerment, and have a state of mindfulness. And what does that mean? They're, to me, they are not meaningful terms because there's no way to find out if you've reached that. And then right. you're yeah, depending yeah. on another person to tell you when you've reached it. And if you're paying money into that group, they'll make sure you never reach it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, the less reasonable a cult is, the more men seek to establish it by force. Hey, Rachel. Um, yes. I have listened to a, a podcast series called Sounds Like Hate. And it, it's made by Southern Poverty Law Center, and mm. um, it's about hate groups. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I was really struck by was there's a terrible organization called The Base. And um, they somehow got like 80 hours of their phone conversations. And a mm-hmm. lot of it was these recruitment uh, conversations. And, and they all said the same thing. You know, when they said, well, why do you want to join? Um, and they would say, uh, you know, where I live, nobody is like me. Uh, I, you know, my family doesn't really understand me. I don't have anybody to talk to. I really want a group of guys around me that I, you know, that understand me. So it, it, clearly they're filling a hole with this idea. And um, I wonder during the pandemic, uh, given that there's more isolation do you think that increases our overall vulnerability to things like cults? I think the fact that QAnon and other groups like it have grown so monumentally is because of this perfect storm. It's because people are feeling disconnected. It's because people are feeling fearful there is a pandemic and they also don't know whom to trust because politics have been so divisive. And I think also people only have their computers now or their phones to stay connected to the world because they're dealing with so much isolation. So 
groups have grown exponentially and I've, I've never been busier. I get 10 to 20 calls a day from new people wanting to talk to me or needing to talk to me. Um, Which reminds me, yeah. um, could we just take a minute right now? Adam is really bothering me. Is there a... Uh, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> I was just wondering if we... I didn't we, consent to a session, Paula. I, I was just wondering if we could take a few minutes. I don't know if no. it's appropriate. <laughs> it's but not. I was just wondering it's, if no. we could work out. Okay, I never mind. I would rather mind. not. Never, okay. never mind, Rachel. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Because <laughs> that's what keeps our relationship healthy. It's good. Right? It's this, it's this uh-huh. friction, this constant friction. <laughs> Now, has there ever been a group like Q as long as we're talking about it? I mean, because Q doesn't have a leader or not a leader that they're allowed to know. Yeah, they think it has a leader. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, QAnon and, you know, other groups, again, like it, um, have this whole kind of conspiratorial thing and they're looking for scapegoats and it can get scary. And, you know, it's usually the same old, same old scapegoats. But with QAnon... Because there isn't an obvious leader, I think what that does is when when there's an absence of information, we as human beings fill in the blanks with what we want Uh. to be true. And so I think it's added to this sort of magical deification of Mm -hmm. the leader because we don't know that there's someone in their mom's basement. We haven't seen them. And so, and, and it could be also that part of the appeal has been that a lot of things have been given out in riddles. And so people feel like they have somehow deciphered something like it's the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like it, it sort of Uh raises to this level of importance, even though none of it makes sense. Right. And I think it, you know, and also what what I think is scary about a lot of it um, is that within these groups, once you're already kind of strapped in for the ride, the crazier idea, the more believable it is, which which is hard for people to kind of understand from the outside. But yeah, why is that? So there's something about when you introduce an idea that's pure mythology to people on the outside, they'll say, that's ridiculous, that's crazy. But crazy no longer sounds crazy to a lot of these people because if you're in the mindset, you think, that sounds so crazy, and who would make something like that up? It must be true. Like Their Pizza mind Gate. has flipped. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Let me refocus us on, on the Q thing for just a second because I want to make the logical segue, which is the, the QAnon theory was that 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 Donald Trump was the only hope to fight um the, this child pornography and murder cult right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um let's segue then into talking about how Trump support in general is or isn't like a cult right so you know i remember when uh trump was elected i mean it was a it was a hard evening for a lot of people. I remember eating all of my leftover Halloween candy. That's sort of how I handled it at the moment. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> I'm I'm really impressed that you had leftover Halloween I, candy. I, Good for you. I think I get the kind I don't like. <laughs> so, all the way in November. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Uh, at the same time, uh, I got a lot of calls and emails from um, former cult members who said that the sort of the hair is up on the back of their necks. They can feel the similarity. Wow. And I started looking at this and I started taking all these characteristics that I apply to cults and seeing all of them play out. And it is a fascinating thing. It's very disturbing. You can see how easily people can be influenced too. I mean, one of the things, well, here are the things that I noticed about the Trump presidency. First of okay. all, with, within cults, there is this divisiveness. A cult leader will set up a competition so that there is this sort of false war going on that you get very involved in. And there's a hierarchy and you're always jockeying for a position and you have people you can't trust and the people you can trust, it's very black and white. And you you then are supposed to be fighting each other, which the cult leader loves. They sort of sit back and watch it all happen, this thing that they've created, which I think Mm -hmm. Trump did as well. You're also not allowed to question. If you question, even if Trump said, 
mm, something was blue on Monday and said it was green on Tuesday. You can't question that because if you mm -hmm. do, then there's something wrong with you or you're being difficult or you're being argumentative, which also happens within cults. Everything's turned back on you. Also, no one is safe. Only the leader is safe. Even the people who are the most devoted and the most self-sacrificial will like, be thrown under- Like the under... vice president who's loyal for exactly. four years and he, he could be murdered. Right, yes. Yes, without question. And, and that is just, you think about it through the narcissistic lens. There is no one who's allowed to be a threat. There's no one who's allowed to get more attention. There's no one who's allowed to be more right. Right. And, Remember when yeah. they wouldn't let um, Fauci, they wouldn't let Fauci go on the sun, Sunday morning television shows mm. um, when mm -hmm. they were giving those daily um, briefings mm -hmm. and Trump didn't have any information. Fauci had the information, but Trump would go on and say whatever. And they wouldn't let Fauci go out because he might say something that Trump didn't say. And it was going to give him a lot of attention. Oh, yeah. And the ones who were the most demonized, I think, within this administration, including what happens in cults, are the ones who are the most talented, the ones who are the brightest, the ones who people are going to connect with and who are going to trust and who are going to listen to. They threaten the leader. The leader doesn't care about you having honest information. The leader cares about being the source of your information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have within a cult, a lot of people who just learn to coast, they have somebody in charge, they go into automatic pilot, and they have someone who's fighting their fights, who they think is taking care of things. And it's a regressive state, I think. It's like you have this dad or this mom who's in charge, and you can be in the back seat, and they're driving. And Gosh, so, wouldn't that be great, by the way? I, it would Don't be you lovely. really wish such a thing were possible? Like, just that somebody else had the answers, and you could just kind of kick back <laughs> that would be delightful yeah um, that is a great idea and i think the other thing is that the rules only apply to everybody else so within a cult and also i think with trump so he could get away with anything the rules don't apply to him the laws don't apply to him and so he's developed a team of attorneys he's developed the loopholes. He's developed the the intimidation and the fear tactics to make sure that he can keep getting away with things. I was very nervous, and I also got lots of calls from former cult members who were very nervous during the time of the first impeachment trial when nothing happened because I thought, oh no, this is where you start to create more of a monster. Because it because, reinforces the idea exactly. that nothing can happen? Oh, exactly. wow. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. when things started getting really ugly, even uglier. Do you think that flies are attracted to uh, <laughs> to high level cult followers? Is there anything there? Um, no, I just think that was a lucky coincidence. <laughs> okay, uh, here's a practical question: What can you do for cult members? You always read that you you can't just talk them out of their cult. What can you do to help somebody who's in a cult? What's the best way forward? Right. It's true. You can't just expect to do that kind of intervention. I mean, I do do interventions, not the kinds that you see on TV where it's a whole bunch of people sitting in a room and they're talking to the person who has the issue. That's never mm -hmm. going to work with a cult member. Um, so what I think you want to first think about is that a lot of people who have left cults have already been emotionally and spiritually out for a long time before they were physically out, before they had the nerve, the confidence, the bravery to actually leave. So you don't want to then be critical of them and come on too strong and say, I told you so, because you're going to push them right back into something they were already questioning. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you help them see what they have been kept from seeing and to say, I don't necessarily need to be right. Uh, I don't need to call what you're in a cult. But there's some information out here that is available about the group that you're in that you haven't had access to. And I would love out of love and respect for you, to, for you to be able to have access to it. And then you can make up your own mind. And this is how I define a cult. 
I'm not saying the group that you're in is in one, even if you're sure that it is. But Mm -hmm. why don't you then, if you go back or you think about your time, think about these characteristics and see if they were present there. And then you'll have a full picture. So help help the people to see things for themselves. Because if you just pull someone out of a cult into another direction, you're not any better than the cult leader, right? You're just yanking them in another direction. So I I like to be able to I would would say you're still a little better than the cult leader. (laughs) Not the way I do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you are a little better, right? I said, get out of that group and now sign this. (laughs) Uh, That's probably not the right approach. Um, Wow. Well, Rachel Bernstein, your insights into cults are fantastic. One more thing before you go. It was truly great to be able to have a conversation with Paula and with Adam. They are so smart and so interesting and funny, and I could have talked to them truly for hours. There are some people I know who listen to this podcast regularly and who say that sometimes it gets very heavy and they have to be geared up and ready for the intensity of the stories, and I get that. I want to clarify also that I'm usually not that intense. Those sorts of things, though, are intense that we talk about here on the show. Actually, I love to laugh and I love to make people laugh. And it was really fun to be able to talk about this subject in both a serious and a funny way. And if I ever make a joke or sound sarcastic when talking about any of these subjects, it is not at all to make light of it. But sometimes, It's just good to keep things emotionally in balance for everyone. And I do make sure that when we tell the stories on this show, because they're sometimes gut-wrenching and usually very meaningful and powerful, I feel they deserve respect and a more somber and serious conversation. There's something we talked about briefly, which was about how people get out and how to do an intervention. And I want to make sure to expand on that a little bit. There are a number of new techniques that are used to help people intervene. And I'm happy to speak more about that at another time. And I've also given some talks about that and some lectures about how families and friends can intervene and the kind of conversations people can have with their loved ones when they're trying to get them out of some bad situation or how to approach these kinds of conversations in a way that's gonna be potentially more successful than other ways. You can find some of my talks on the website for the International Cultic Studies Association, as well as on my YouTube channel, and a bit here and there on this podcast. I mentioned on the show that interventions done for people who are coming out of these kinds of groups or these kinds of relationships that we talk about here on the show are not the kind that people are familiar with because of things like the show called Intervention that was on the air for a number of years, where you have a whole number of people sitting around in a room and they have planned things to say, and the person who they're worried about, usually because they need some sort of rehab program to be admitted into right after the intervention, is it's not the way these kinds of interventions are done. If someone who's been made very worried about their family intervening and usually a controller or a cult leader has already made it difficult, if not downright impossible, to even have time to talk to and interact with a loved one involved in a cult, they've been made to feel that if their family wants to see them, it is because the family is trying to take them away the family's going to try to extract them from this situation. So in those situations, a cult member or someone who's being controlled is going to be assuming that's what's going to happen when they get together with their family. So if they walk into a room that's filled with family members and friends and people they haven't seen in a while who have been added to the team, like their pastor or their third grade teacher or whoever was incorporated, they will make usually an immediate U-turn out of that room. Interventions are done in a very specialized way in these situations. Sometimes it's just a one-on-one conversation. 
And it's done so it's not a whole group of people. It, it's not meant to overwhelm. It's not made to make people afraid. What's also important to note is that it used to be, for the most part, that the way to get people out of a cult, out of a bad situation, was to take them out of it. So the stories that I've heard that predate my work in this field, where people were kidnapped out, put in a van, taken away, held in some space against their will, where they could not be found by members of the cult or by the person who was abusing them. Well, in some of these situations, as I've also heard, it actually did save the person's life when it really was a life or death situation, when the group was planning for a mass suicide or when they knew their loved one was being horribly abused, but their mind was too confused. They were being too controlled to act on their own behalf and save themselves or people who were taken off medication they needed and were slowly dying because of medical neglect. And for some families, it was their only choice to act immediately and to grab their loved one. There now are newer ways to approach it, which don't have that level of intensity. And really, it is more of just a conversation where people can leave at any time. And I want you to know that there has been kind of... Mm, a misuse of the term deprogramming. If you look at it just as a translation of the term, you are deprogramming a person who has been programmed. And again, if I'm involved in something like that, it is just a conversation. There's nothing nefarious about it. You're just freeing somebody from the way they were manipulated to think and to feel that has been harmful for them. But I want to clarify this specifically because Scientology has decided that the word deprogram or deprogramming means that the person who is involved in a bad situation is being kidnapped and being held against their will. And it's not what deprogramming means. That's just called kidnapping. That's illegal. And so... There are some families who have needed to do that in order to save their loved ones' lives, but those are not cases I would be involved with as life or death situations should be left to the police or the FBI. And I also want to make sure that I am able to tell you that when I'm ever interviewed for an article or anything where they say, they call me a cult deprogrammer or ask me, how do you deprogram such and such people from such and such group? Scientology, in connection with those articles or those interviews, have said, aha, see, she does do these horrible things. She does hold people against their will. She does put them in a van. There's always a van involved somehow in this scenario. Um, and that's just not the case. If anyone knows me also, I'm the person who, you know, when I find a spider in my house, I put it in a cup and put it outside. I don't want to overpower anything or anyone, and especially someone who has been overpowered, where they've had their power taken away. I want to give it back, not take it away just in a different way. And so going back now to the notion of kind of how I intervene. Sometimes I will be doing it in person, one-on-one -on -one, or with other people as part of a team to do the intervention. And sometimes it's from behind the scenes. The person who is having the intervention done sometimes doesn't ever meet me or meet with me. I wanted to tell you a story though, going back to, we were talking initially about humor, Mm, sometimes I say things inadvertently where I might make somebody laugh in a certain situation. It's not intentional, but I might just blurt things out. And it's also an example of how I was able to help a situation from behind the scenes because 
it's not important for me to be the one who is helping that person. Mm, it's important for me to help somebody else get out of a situation or to help somebody else help somebody else to get out of that situation. I don't need to necessarily get the credit. And so let me tell you a story about making someone laugh at the wrong time, quite unfortunately. A family was worried about their daughter, whose boyfriend had invited her to come stay with him over a school holiday. And the family did not have any intention of letting her go. It was quite a deranged situation where the parents had met her at their church. She had been raised in a fundamentalist family and was the new Sunday school teacher at the church near her college campus where this family lived. And she came to a service there to introduce herself to the congregation. And on the spot, the family chose her without her knowledge. They decided that she would be their son's bride one day very soon. They told their son meeting her was a sign from God, and they introduced her to their son. And the son came on very strong and was very convincing and determined to follow God's will. And this girl started to date him for what she thought might just be a brief relationship. And relationship to her meant maybe holding hands. And, you know, she kept it very rated G because of her fundamentalist background. She thought there was something charming about him, but also something off about him. And she wasn't quite sure that she wanted to be a part of this. But then the family, his family, invited her to come stay with them for a school holiday. And it was going to be too expensive for her to fly back home. So it actually was nice for her to have a family to spend the holidays with. So she said, OK. She, of course, was sleeping in a separate room from the sun. And her own family was not worried. They even encouraged her to be polite and bring a gift to the family to thank them for their hospitality. But the day came when she was supposed to return to her college campus, and they told her that God had spoken to them and that she had been designated the one to continue the lineage of the family. Anyone outside of that situation would see that as a script for a horror movie. And when she did not return to school because they had put the fear of God in her if she did so, her roommate, who had become a good friend at that point, even though they had different religious leanings, contacted her parents to ask if everything was okay. The parents didn't know that she hadn't come back to school, so they start calling hospitals and police. And finally, the parents, who had been given the boyfriend's address, flew to Chicago, where this was taking place, and went to the family's home. They saw her car in the driveway. So when the family knocked on the door and introduced themselves, the family inside called the police. And the police did what they do, which is sometimes nothing, unfortunately. They just said, is your daughter over 18? Well, yes. Then she has the right to stay. She has the right to do what she wants. She's an adult, and she can choose to stay if she wants. The parents were begging and pleading, but the police just kept saying the same thing. They don't understand these situations necessarily, and they don't ask the right follow-up questions. So they called me, and we discussed kind of handing the baton over to the roommate. It was all happening too fast for me to be able to meet with anyone in person, so we decided that the roommate would have her phone on with an earpiece, you know, headset, and I could hear the conversation pretty well and kind of guide her in her ear about what to do and what to say. So she showed up at the family's door and introduced herself and said that she knew her roommate was inside and she needed to talk to her. As I said, this was Chicago, and it turned out it was February, and it was about seven degrees outside. And she was begging, actually, to come in at that point because she was freezing. And the father, who had answered the door, told her that he could tell she was not as pure as her roommate and therefore would not be welcomed inside their home. And when she asked why he felt she was not pure enough, he said, it's in your eyes. 
I can see your soul through your eyes. You have sinned. You have lusted. You have fornicated. And you have darker Semitic skin. You must have Jewish blood. Your mother or your mother's mother prostituted herself to another race. There was a pause. While she was sort of waiting for me to give her a response that she could say out loud to him. And unfortunately, what came out of my mouth, and I pardon anyone who was offended by swearing, but this is the only thing that came to mind. I just said, what an asshole. So this, as I mentioned before, unfortunately made her laugh out loud. And then she did a brilliant save where, of course, he was assuming she was laughing at him. And she said instead, oh, no, 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 I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because you're right. And I'm wondering how you knew all that. I must admit I'm impressed. Genius. Well, this gained her entry into the house. And just for anyone who wants to know how the story ends, she was able to get the family to allow her to stay overnight. I suggested into her ear that she tell them that the roads were too icy for her to drive on. It was actually true. It was pretty precarious out there. And after sharing a room in this home with her roommate and having the roommate to herself and seeing that her roommate actually looked very confused and frightened by the situation, but felt she had no choice but to stay and that God would punish her for leaving, the roommate acted on the notion that we had talked about, about temporarily joining with someone's language and thought process in order for them to feel understood. So she was able to help her roommate to see things more clearly in a way I think that was translatable to her by saying, you know, God is not in this place. I can feel it. You're scared and you're trapped. So it seems the devil might be actually working through this family. And that means we both need to get out now. So they actually did in the middle of the night. And you never know how some of these things are going to go and why they're going to be successful. And sometimes it's just luck. And then she made me laugh when she whispered into the phone to me while her roommate was quickly packing up her things. Not bad for an atheist, huh? Yep, not bad at all. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.